Shalom and a very warm welcome to each of you. Thanks so much for joining us for yet another Traveling Tuesdays. Tonight's topic will be biblical inscriptions. Uh, these are archaeological discoveries uh, that connect us to the Bible. Now, originally, I was simply going to maybe approach the archaeological evidence supporting the Bible's historicity from a more general point of view, looking at artifacts and, and of course, inscriptions, uh, biblical sites. Although we've sort of have done that already in previous teachings, so I thought we would sort of just hone in on uh, inscriptions, and there's many of them. In fact, uh, I don't know, I maybe have 40 of them or so, maybe not that many, but uh, around that number of uh, inscriptions that have been found that, again, connect us directly to the Bible. And I know there's more that uh, I'm not covering or sharing, but uh, I thought this might be a, a fun way, and I hope an exciting way, to engage each of us in how all of these inscriptions, again, connect us to God's Word as we honor it as historically accurate and true in every detail. So that's our intent in this session. And uh, with this, let's launch right into our teaching today. Let me share my screen, and we'll be off and running. Again, thanks so much for joining us as we, again, use archaeology and the archaeological world to help us understand the Bible. So a couple quotes from pretty much archaeologists uh, from years past. But uh, they're really right on, and I think it uh, begins this presentation with uh, an understanding that archaeology indeed will confirm and reveal uh, the Bible's historicity. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. I know of no finding in archaeology that's properly confirmed, which is in opposition to the scriptures. The Bible is the most accurate history textbook the world has ever seen. In every instance where the findings of archaeology pertain to the biblical record, the archaeological evidence confirms, sometimes in detailed fashion, the historical accuracy of scripture. You see, one after another, we have these perspectives from real archaeologists like Bill Deaver and these other gentlemen. Uh, Bill said the only new facts about the Bible and the biblical world are coming from the ground. In fact, that's one reason why we, we participate in archaeological digs. Maybe the father of modern archaeology in some respects, uh, William Albright said there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of Old Testament tradition. And I know of no finding in archaeology that's properly confirmed, which is in opposition to the scriptures. Uh, the Bible is the most accurate history textbook the world has ever seen. So these are good quotes, and I hope that uh, it sort of sets the tone for this first inscription. And again, what we're going to do is sort of rattle these off a little quickly, uh, in a quick format, I should say, because I want to show you the picture, and I want you to understand what we're looking at. Uh, and there's probably more detail that uh, can be shared about these, but you'll get the, the sense. And again, we're after the connection with the Bible. So Elat Mazar, who's the granddaughter of uh, Benjamin Mazar, uh, she found this in the Ophel of Jerusalem, just south of the Temple Mount, and uh, it's a very, very important one. Found a couple of years ago, it says, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. This dates to 2,700 years ago, and we see uh, here is the word, two 
or belonging to Hezekiah, the son of the king of Judah. Here's the translation of it. And you can notice that the, the two-winged sun disk is also flanked, interestingly enough, by the symbol of life in Egypt. And I believe that this is the first time, uh, maybe in the 8th century here, uh, when this Egyptian symbol of life is actually used uh, in Judah. I'm not sure why that is, but uh, I don't believe it, it appears before the 8th century. But uh, we have an inscription with the name Hezekiah, of course, one of the kings of Judah. Now, just about six months after this inscription uh, was found, the Hezekiah one, uh, this particular one was found, and it notes uh, the words Isaiah the prophet, although the last word is, or the last letter actually is missing here. Uh, but uh, most scholars and archaeologists believe that this is the Isaiah, the prophet, contemporary with Hezekiah. Of course, again, uh, late 8th century, about 700 B.C. Nathan Melech, servant of the king. This is a name that appears in 2 Kings chapter 23. This was found uh, in the new Gavati parking lot excavation just to the west of the city of David. If you've been to Israel, uh, an old parking lot was excavated. Actually, they went underneath it, and then now it's a, a massive excavation. And this was found, I believe, a couple of years ago. And again, a name that, again, corresponds to the biblical reference. Here's a, a few others as we stay in Jerusalem, at least for the time being. Uh, this name, Yehuchal, I'm probably uh, mispronouncing the Hebrew there, and a guy named Gedaliah. These are two inscriptions that appear in the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah being a prophet, again, about 100 years after the time of Isaiah. Uh, this is at the time of the Babylonians, and these two guys were uh, officials, apparently, government officials who tried to have Jeremiah executed for treason. So here on these very small seals, uh, seal impression, bulai, they're made of clay, uh, these are names that, again, link us or connect us to the Bible. Here's another one, a 7th century uh, clay seal, reading belonging to Adunayahu. Adunayahu. Again, the pronunciation, uh, I'm not sure what the modern pronunciation is of this name, but uh, we do know that uh, it appears or at least connects us to uh, the Bible. This was found recently in the City of David Sifting Project, which was taken from uh, Rob Robinson's Arch, which was discovered in 1838, if you recall, the southwest corner of the temple. So again, very, very small and tiny. And speaking of tiny inscriptions, here's yet another one. It says, to the governor of the city. Now, this is probably, again, 7th, 6th century B.C., found very close to the Western Wall uh, today. And uh, again, this phrase appears a, a few times in the Bible, to the governor of the city. It didn't have a name on it specifically, but yet we can uh, take note of how this phrase, again, uh, is seen in the Bible. We're staying in Jerusalem now, and we're talking about something from the Second Temple period now. Uh, and uh, this is uh, really, really interesting. Uh, the Frenchman Clermont Guinot in 1871 found the first one, uh, an inscription that was actually a part of this short wall that separated the court of the Gentiles and the court of the Israelites. This is a model of the, the Temple Mount, of course, a model that's now displayed at the Israel Museum. Uh, but there was a short wall, and every opening there was a Greek inscription. Why Greek? Because it was intended for non-Jews. And uh, Gano said it's remarkable that the stone that 
comes from the ancient Jewish temple hasn't been carried away far, uh, far from its original location. Indeed, this was found, as he says, only 50 meters away from uh, the Dome of the Rock today, the Sanctuary of the Jews, uh, where the temple once stood, both the first and second temples. So I think this is quite fascinating, but uh, what is it and what, what was his purpose? Well, this was a warning uh, to Gentiles that they could go no farther than this particular dividing wall. In fact, if you did, you would be ensuing death upon yourself. In fact, this is what basically it says, uh, translated from the Greek. Not one foreigner is to enter inside uh, or around the sanctuary, barrier or embankment. He who has seized himself responsible is for the following death penalty. Of course, the English is a little awkward here, but you get the sense that uh, this particular stone, um, which was now, by the way, displayed in the Istanbul Museum, because it was found during the Ottoman Empire up through 1917. Uh, this was uh, a remarkable discovery, and uh, it really helps us uh, connect with, for instance, Acts 21, when Paul and his buddy from Ephesus, they go into the Israelite court, and of course they're not sure if this Ephesian guy is uh, a Jew. Paul, of course, is, but uh, they would have seen this, Jesus would have seen this, as he would have entered the, the court of the Israelites. And uh, let me just go back to this one, because in 1935, uh, a second inscription was found, actually in secondary use, uh, outside Lion's Gate. And this one is displayed today in the Israel Museum. Some of you have seen it. Again, it's in Greek, and just a, a portion of this death penalty warning, if you will, for Gentiles. You could not go any farther than that. I like to think that when Paul writes in Ephesians, uh, he writes about the dividing wall that separates the Gentiles and the Jews. And of course, through the efficacy of Christ and his sacrifice um, on the cross, uh, now this dividing wall is torn down, uh, meaning that Jew and Gentile alike have full access to God. So I think that maybe Paul was... Uh, referring to this dividing wall between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the Israelites uh, when he wrote that back to the church of Ephesus. In 1961 in Caesarea, again in secondary use, uh, somewhere in the theater, uh, this primary source in Latin was discovered. You can see the word Tiberium and Pilatus, this would be Pontius Pilate. He was residing in Caesarea uh, at the time of uh, Jesus. And when, of course, Jesus is in Jerusalem for the last time, Pilate is in the city himself, and he is the one who condemns Jesus to death. Uh, there it is, a primary source being used in a secondary fashion in the theater of Caesarea, 1961. And uh, an earlier uh, inscription, actually around the same time, but just, uh, I think, recently revealed uh, on a ring. The name Pilate again appears for the second time. Now, just recently, again, this is displayed today in the Israel Museum. Uh, they found this pillar uh, with the name of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. There it is. And uh, this dates to the first century BC, found in 2018. And uh, we have uh, a name here that really connects us to uh, the full name of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, I guess it is first century uh, AD, I said BC, but uh, in that second temple period, uh, again, just very important because here the name uh, appears as it's spelled in the Hebrew Bible, uh, we have the name Jerusalem. The IAA also 
uh, found this 27 year old papyrus. Uh, they took it from thieves who had taken it from a desert cave near the Dead Sea. And as we talk about Jerusalem, we're talking about, again, the mentioning of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and this is the earliest of the mentionings outside the Bible. You know, this gentleman is actually uh, showing with his computer-generated uh, imaging uh, the name of Jerusalem. So an inscription, again, found on some papyrus from the Dead Sea. This was found actually in, I believe, the, the grain silo area of Megiddo in 1904. It's the name Shema, the servant of Jeroboam. This would be the second King Jeroboam who reigned in the northern kingdom, but Shema is the name that appears in 2 Kings chapter 14. So here, of course, we have a symbol of the lion and the name Shema connects us to Second Kings. Now, uh, of course, you find all kinds of pottery at archaeological digs, but uh, this one actually has a name on it, Zechariah. And of course, Zechariah is a common name that's uh, found in the Bible. Here's a reference in Second Chronicles chapter 20, uh, but uh, there's a 7th century BC uh, name here, and uh, again, connects us to Second Chronicles 20. Uh, by the way, this type of Hebrew text is a Paleo-Hebrew, a, a, a primary former uh, script of Hebrew before, of course, the letters that we have today. And uh, just to remind you, it's read from right to left. Now, uh, seal impressions, royal seal impressions, uh, many of these have been found, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And uh, we have, again, uh, they are, they're appearing on uh, jar handles uh, primarily. In fact, I had the opportunity to find one back in 1982 at the City of David, a royal seal impression that said something to the effect, uh, Lamelech to the king below, or belonging to the king. So here we have uh, these, uh, again, a two-winged uh, symbol here, and, and typically on a piece of pottery or a jar handle. Again, lamellic seal, that's what they're called, to or belonging to the king. In 1935, uh, the Lachish letters were found here within the outer gate chamber of the city. Uh, now, credit to Dr. Chris McKinney, who I guess knows uh, personally the uh, this gentleman who is actually holding what we call Lachish letter number four in his hand. And uh, this is quite, quite impressive because this particular piece of pottery, this is called an ostracon. Ostraca is the plural, but uh, this particular one uh, lists a couple names of Judah at the time of the Babylonian invasion of the city, of really the land, uh, the land of Judah. So here we have uh, this particular piece of pottery with these words on it. And your servant is not sending him there anymore, but when morning comes around, and may my Lord be apprised that we are watching for the fire signals of Lachish, according to all the signs which my Lord has given, because we cannot see Azakah. You can see the location between uh, these two cities in relationship to Jerusalem. It's about 30 miles from Lachish to Jerusalem, and Azakah is, of course, in between off the Ela Valley in the Shvela or the lowlands of Judah. So apparently when the Babylonians were conquering the land of Judah, uh, these were the two last standing cities, and uh, you would think that they probably communicated uh, together uh, by the use of fire signals, maybe on top of the site. In fact, I've been on Lachish and Azakal many times, and uh, you can actually, on a clear day, you can see uh, the top of Azakah from Lachish. Imagine if this was a fire signal. So this was the way of communicating, if you will, between these two last standing cities. Well, it's interesting that, again, connecting to the Bible, this is precisely what Jeremiah would write as well. 
as he says, Lachish and Azekah. They were the only fortified cities remaining of the cities of Judah. So isn't this a remarkable connection? We have an uh, archaeological inscription that, again, uh, verifies the, the historicity of the words of Jeremiah. So thanks to Luke Chandler for this particular picture of uh, one of the inscriptions that were found at Kherbet Kayafa by Yossi Garfinkel about 10, 12 years ago or so. Uh, and this one actually is amazing because it mentions the name of a king. I shouldn't say a name, excuse me. Uh, it references a king. It says, do not oppress and serve God, despoiled him or her. The judge and the widow wept, and he had the power. Over the resin alien and the child, he eliminated them together. And here's, I think, the most critical part of it. The men and chiefs or officers have established a king. Now, this dates from the 11th or 10th century BC. Uh, and uh, is this maybe a reference to King David, even though not by name? We'll be looking at an inscription that actually mentions uh, House of David um, from a, an excavation in a, an inscription found at Tel Dan further north. But here we have a reference to a, the establishing of a king. So could this be an indirect reference to David? Then another inscription was found, more of an, in a Canaanite script, I believe. And uh, this one actually mentions the name Eshbaal ben Bada. Eshbaal, very important name. It actually appears in the time of the judges. Uh, Jerubobol, Baal. Baal was the storm god uh, the, of and rain and thunder god, if you will. The name Baal means Lord. So here again, from uh, the 11th or 10th century, uh, we have the name of Eshbaal. But it's interesting that this name Baal in any form doesn't appear in any uh, bulai, it should say. Sorry, not bull any bulai uh, or inscription after this. Uh, and that's probably because this name Baal was associated with uh, this foreign pagan god of rain and thunder. But that's at least the theory by uh, Dr. Garfinkel and uh, others suggest this as well. But again, uh, here, a second inscription, can you believe it, found at Kayafa. I love this one, by the way. Uh, this is found about 100 years ago, and it's called the Gezer Calendar. And it really gives us the agricultural seasons of ancient Israel. Two months of harvest, planting, two months of late planting, one month of hoeing, one month of barley harvest, a month of harvest and festival, two months of grape harvesting, one month of summer fruit. Uh, it was signed by a guy named Abijah. Maybe he was the scribe, but uh, this dates to, again, the 10th century B.C., found at Gezer. So we can open our Bibles to, for instance, Ecclesiastes 3. I guess I don't have a slide of this, but when Solomon, who, by the way, was the king about the time that this dates to, uh, he writes that there is a season for everything. Perhaps you are familiar with e Ecclesiastes 3, and uh, whereas we have... Uh, an agricultural season, seasonal calendar, I should say. Uh, Solomon ends up giving us uh, sort of a seasonal perspective of, of life. There's a time to be happy, sad, mourn, uh, live, to die, you name it. Uh, there's all kinds of seasons um, in listed in the, uh, that e passage in Ecclesiastes 3, and uh, maybe they correspond in some way. But this certainly represents uh, what was experienced agriculturally there in the, the 10th century. There's a closer view of this inscription. I believe it's about the size of a piece of 8 by 10 paper. And again, I believe this is in the Istanbul Museum. Here's another one from Tel Rehov near Beit Shan. Uh, and near the uh, the Jordan Valley. 
Uh, but this uh, mentions this name Nimshi, perhaps the same name as the father or grandfather of the biblical king Jehu. Now, it's interesting that Elisha sends a disciple to anoint Jehu, a member of the family of Nimshi, the king of Israel. So uh, there is a debate, by the way, of an inscription that lists the name of Elisha, but I believe that there is not really a consensus on the validity of that. But here we at least have uh, what appears to be a connection to the Bible and uh, to the family of Jehu, the name Nimshi, found at Tel Rehov. Here is a, another closer look at this inscription. I mentioned the Dan inscription, found in 1991 or number 1992, and uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, very, very important. It's written in an Aramaic text. It dates to the 9th century BC, and here we have the House of David. Apparently, it's uh, Ben-Hadad or Haziel, maybe Haziel, I should say, who's uh, saying how he defeated uh, the house of David. The Arameans, of course, were the northern enemy of Israel and Judah, and uh, perhaps uh, this is uh, his own mentioning of the house of David, and again, most likely the one only inscription here found in Israel that uh, records the name of David outside the Bible. Uh, we perhaps could take a look at, and we will, at the Moabite stele uh, that uh, perhaps, uh, as some would suggest, mentions David there as well. But uh, it's interesting that uh, this has been found up north, uh, again, in secondary use. Let's return to Jerusalem, because this is an exciting one. Uh, at the Ben Hinnom uh, Valley tombs. This is the, the most famous one. Over a thousand items and 263 intact vessels were actually found in this what we call repository. Now, the bench of the tomb uh, was up top. In fact, I think I have a picture of myself la uh, uh, laying here, here, uh, as one uh, a deceased person. This of course, was for many people. You can see the, the headdress that would have uh, been for the head. One body here, here I am. Here's another one would have been placed here next to me. Here's another one this way, and then maybe another one this way. But underneath where right below my head is, is this repository. And uh, in this repository, uh, this silver amulet was found, and it's quite, quite impressive. Uh, Dr. Gabi Barkai was a part of this. Gordon Franz was a part of this. Dr. John Munson uh, was a part of this uh, dig when he was uh, just a, a kid in high school. But uh, it says uh, something from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. He Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. That's an amazing discovery. Here we have, again, the earliest and the only uh, inscription that mentions the name of God found in, uh, I think it was 1979-ish, 1980 perhaps, but uh, uh, very, very delicately deciphered, unrolled, and this is displayed in the Israel Museum today. Of course, we can't uh, not talk about Hezekiah's tunnel. We already saw an inscription with his name on it. This is a 1,720-foot tunnel. Uh, as many of you know, it starts at the Gihon Spring and ends here at a, a reservoir that was uh, made in, for the intent of bringing water safely into the city, inside the city walls, uh, when Sennacherib and the Assyrians were surrounding uh, the city. This is mentioned in 2 Kings 20, 2 Chronicles 32. But about, uh, I don't know, 25 feet from the end of this tunnel, this inscription was found. Uh, this is a replica, of course. Here's the real one that's housed at the Istanbul Museum. Incidentally, I had a chance to see it in, uh, when was it, uh, August of 1982. And it was collecting dust on the third floor of this museum. It was not really important. I believe it should really be back in Jerusalem, but here it is. 
Uh, it was excavated um, or cut out of that tunnel and uh, basically tells us that two teams of rock cutters, I'll just go back to this slide if I may, right there, two teams of rock cutters actually uh, chiseled this tunnel, one team starting here at the southern end and the other team here until they met actually right in the middle. It's a quite a fascinating engineering feat and the inscription actually talks about it how they finally broke through with uh, about three cubits left. They heard each other's voices, their picks, and then they have no doubt jumped for joy and, and broke through. So uh, quite, quite an impressive inscription. Uh, this is actually an inscription that goes, uh, takes us away from Israel and uh, goes to, to Greece. Actually, Delphi is the city. And uh, you can see that this is the name right here in the middle, and we'll circle it here. Galio is the name that's mentioned. He was, well, we'll see in a min minute, but there it is. Uh, his name is spelled here. Well, who was he? Well, he's the guy who appears in Acts chapter 18. He was the proconsul, uh, apparently from 51 to 52. So his name appears, and of course, uh, apparently he's also in Corinth when Paul was there. And it says when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. Verse 13 saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. And uh, again, he served during the time of Paul. So again, a primary source of the name that appears in the Bible. This is another uh, inscription, again, outside the Bible. Uh, this is called the Taylor Prism or the Sennacherib Prism. And uh, here we have King Sennacherib. He was a king that uh, took rule, I think, in 705 BC, about four years prior to attacking Jerusalem. But uh, he mentions, uh, let me just go back here. He mentions uh, how he captured 46 Judean cities. He surrounded Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. Uh, he's a name that appears in Isaiah 36 and 7, of course, as well. Uh, he's the one who attacked uh, uh, Lachish, in fact, uh, as displayed in the British Museum. It's a, it's a huge uh, relief, if you will. Uh, a wall relief that was taken from Nineveh, from his palace there, that uh, shows how important this battle against the Judeans at Lachish actually was. <clears throat> but here in a cuneiform text, uh, we have his own words. I love that word uh, or a phrase, I surrounded Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. This is when Hezekiah was completing the, the tunnel project. So we go to uh, the area of Jordan today, the Moabite stele. You can see the close-up text here. Uh, again, it's a very important text. It talks about Mesha in terms of uh, his bragging of what he did to uh, Judah and uh, actually Israel. Uh, Omri, the king of Israel, had oppressed Moab many days for Chamosh, who was the Mo Moabite king, uh, excuse me, uh, God, by the way, was angry with his land. His son succeeded him, and he too said, I will oppress Moab. So there's a reference to Omri, uh, but it's interesting that Mesha claims to have defeated ancient Israel and uh, many of their sites, although uh, apparently the Bible uh, says something to the contrary. This was found, by the way, in 1868, and it dates to the 9th century B.C. This is another phrase that appears uh, on, I think there's like 30 or 31 lines of this that are decipherable. But uh, notice that, uh, could this be in the house of David? Uh, could this be uh, another reference to uh, David? But uh, we have uh, this reference by King Mesha. Of course, he's mentioned uh, in the Bible. And uh, again, it connects us to uh, 
the Moabites, in fact, the Bible actually says this, when the Moabites came to Israel's camp, the Israelites rose up and struck down the Moabites. The Moabites fled before them, and they went forth into the land slaughtering the Moabites. So uh, Mesh's bragging uh, really can't be substantiated. I'm sure there were a few back and forth battles, but the scriptures tell us that the Moabites were the ones suppressed by ancient Israel during the reigns of Omri, Ahab, and Joram. The Merneptah Stele, or the Merneptah Stele, found in 1896 in Thebes, dates to the 13th century B.C. Renepetak was the son of Ramses II. Uh, this is a little taller than the Moabite stele, which is about four feet tall. This is about six feet tall, maybe seven feet tall, and uh, mentions Canaan being plundered, Ashkelon being overcome. These are biblical cities. Gezer, by the way, had been captured. By the way, there were uh, three skeletal remains of Canaanites found by Steve Ortiz in the Iron Age section of the excavation at Gezer. This was a few years ago now, uh, maybe four or five or six years ago, uh, something like that. But it also mentions the name of Israel, which is interesting. So we have the name of Israel. It's actually down here, I believe. That's where it is. So we have, again, a reference to uh, the title Israel here in this Egyptian inscription or stele. Now, uh, we talk about the Philistines. They arrived probably around 1200 BC on the western coastline of Israel. And uh, this one is uh, from the city of Ekron, one of the five Philistine cities. And uh, on this inscription that dates to the 7th century, we have this name of Akish. Well, he appears in the text of 1 Samuel and even in earlier in 1 Kings. Uh, Akish was a, a name of a ruler of the Philistines, and uh, here apparently a ruler of Ekron. Uh, his name was certainly uh, seen in the Bible, and uh, his name appears on this inscription. So uh, that's, the, that's the match that we're after. And then finally, uh, not really an inscription, but certainly uh, something worthwhile to talk about. And maybe this is how we'll end, because at Qumran in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. So these are more than just inscriptions. These are texts of scriptures, texts of sectarian uh, documents of the Essenes. Uh, these are an amazing uh, collection of uh, of text, fragments of text, some say 750, some say 930 fragments of text found now in about 12 caves. And I'm showing you um, really the second longest uh, scroll. I think it's the second longest because the, the temple scroll is the longest one uh, found in cave uh, 11, I believe. But here in cave one in these two jars, uh, the Isaiah scroll was found. So here we again honor uh, the texts of the Dead Sea as they were discovered and deciphered and how important they are uh, to us. So once again, I appreciate you guys uh, joining us and uh, I hope that this uh, session was valuable and beneficial and certainly interesting as again we see all this archaeological uh, evidence through these inscriptions that support the biblical narrative and certainly connect us to the Bible itself. So with that, uh, shalom, shalom, and uh, again, I hope you join us for future teachings about uh, the context of the Bible. We're all about teaching the Bible in the context of the land, archaeology, customs, culture, all of that, so that we can gain a better understanding of the scriptures. So with this, again, shalom and thanks for joining us.